I got some introductory stuff. Gracious and loving God, open our hearts to seek to understand your will, your way, and the things that we might never know. So guide us and direct us as we look at this mystery of the afterlife and accept it in faith and the things you said about it. So guide our thoughts, guide our discussion this morning, help us to speak out when we have a feeling, and let us go forth in your name. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Okay, I don't know what's going on across the hall, but they didn't ask me. We'll get rid of them. Okay, number of announcements. Uh, first of all, there is this box up here. These are Lenten devotions for all 40 pages of Lent. They were a big hit last year and the year before. Um, and so Hope University provides these to the congregation. So there's still about 30 copies up there or something. And today is Ash Wednesday. So that would probably be the first one in here. Yes. And Psalm 51 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. And then it'll go on, things to ponder, and we begin with grace, and it'll take you an entire two and a half minutes to go through this every day. So... Uh, there are certain places you might want to put them and certain places you don't. So, um, okay. Watch it during commercials. Watch it during commercials. Yeah, I, that's, that's a good way to do it. Okay. <clears throat> Today we're going to do the book study on the next person you meet in heaven. Uh, starting next week, you'll have to put up with me for six more weeks as we go through the Gospel of Matthew, which we started back in the fall. And uh, we covered 12 chapters. Now, I got to thinking when Bruce was in here teaching in December, and he says, now for those of you who don't remember what we did before the first of the year, and all the snowbirds who come, what I've done is I've gone through the first 12 weeks, first 12 chapters, and I've consolidated to give you a review next week. Then we'll jump on to 13, 14, 15, then 16, 17, 18. There's 28 chapters in Matthew. So we will get through the entire gospel um, by Holy Week. If not, maybe a week before, but I'm beginning to doubt it. A um, few words um, that were coming to me that I need to share with you, want to share with you, is um, I'm reading through the Bible from front to back for the third time in my life. I've read it many other ways and who knows what directions. Uh, this is March the 6th and I am on Deuteronomy chapter 20. I can only say, it is so boring. <laughs> it is so repetitive. There is a way to read the Bible so that you understand it better. Um, I have presented that almost every year. If you wish, if there are those of you who wish, I'm going to make some copies of the cheat sheet of how to go about Luke and then Acts and then where to go from there. Uh, and I'll have them available next week. So if you are a Lenten person who would like to say, now is the time for me to read through the Bible, I will have those available next week. Um, let's see. Here's the direction we're going to go tonight. It's a little tonight, yeah, today. Two great, two great things happened after class last night. Michigan State won its basketball game, and the Tampa Bay Lightning won its hockey game. So uh, I slept pretty well 
till my CPAP machine started going gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. <laughs> what we want to do today is I want to start with some warm-up quotes. Now, we're in a position here that uh, there's lots of quotes you can put about things. Uh, <laughs> the next person you meet in heaven, Steve Jobs said, man, see, he's there. He's there. So what we're going to do is have some quotes and discussion. Now, there's a word about, I think I have it up here. These quotes will be verbal to protect the copyright of the author. Um, it's very important that you do that. Uh, I lost a million dollars by not doing it. I always say that. The second book I wrote was entitled Affirming Our Faith Together. And it was for parents to teach confirmation to their own children. And the first year that it came out, it sold hundreds of copies. The second year, all of a sudden, at the end of the year, when I was to get my royalty check, it was below $100. And, and I said, wait a minute, something's wrong here. So I asked um, the publishers when I saw them at a church uh, convention uh, what happened. And they said, I don't know. It just it stopped selling. So I knew one pastor who was using it with a fairly large class. And I said, how come you didn't order any more books this year? He said, why should I? It was spiral bound. I just took the pages out and I copied them for the next class. And there were all kinds of pastors out there doing it. I bet I, I, bet I lost $30. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't making that much on it. Um, so I'm going to do some warm-up quotes. I will repeat them. We want this to be participatory. And uh, my runner <laughs> has her microphone ready, and she will provide it for you so that we have a record of that. And if we are live on stream, we welcome those who might be watching. and. Um, we don't know if that's always working. And then we'll get into the five people that Annie meets and the five lessons that are taught from those five people. Then we'll talk more discussion, which will be written discussion, on how do you feel? Um, what do you think about the afterlife? And then if time permits, and I think it will, it did last night, I'll give you what Jesus has to say about the kingdom of heaven. And if you want to then know, and I won't go into it, if you want to then know about the new heaven and the new earth, then you've got to invest in another book. And I have a few of those, quite a few. <laughs> but they're over here, and I've got more in my briefcase. But you look at the 20th, 21st and 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation. And uh, you might as well read the whole book of Revelation, and that's in the book. How many have had that book? Yeah, see, okay. You did, dear? When did you read that? <laughs> Many times. Many times. She was my editor when I wrote it, so, okay. So these quotes are going to be verbal. And jump in whenever you're ready. I don't have five pages of this is enough. Okay. Fifteen years ago, album's first book captivated millions of readers. It sold many millions of copies with a fictional tale of the afterlife and how it answers all of our earthly questions. And you may remember Eddie, uh, either by the book reading the book or by the review that I gave out a couple weeks ago, eight-page review. Okay, after reading, well, I, I want to read his note. Where did he get the inspiration for this? You look at Mitch Album, great writer. Uh, you know, maybe because he was a sports writer that he speaks to me 
so well. But, but he just has a way of putting things that makes it easy for you to understand. He says he was inspired by his uncle, Eddie Beachman. And uh, he was a World War II vet who thought he was a nobody who never did nothing. When I was a child, Eddie told me of a night he nearly died in a hospital and rose from his body to see his departed ones waiting for him at the edge of the bed. From that moment, album says, I viewed heaven as a place where we encounter those we touched on earth and where we get to see them again. But I recognize, he says, this is my view only. There are many others along with many religious definitions and all should be respected. So this novel and its version of the afterlife is a wish, and I'll put it up there, and not a dogma. So hopefully you all know what dogma means. After reading the five people, the next person you meet in heaven, um, no, after reading the five people you meet in heaven, the first five people, that was his first book, uh, who did you expect the next person to be? Just names. Somebody said God. Okay. Guardian angel. Peter? All right. Anybody expect to see Jesus? Or God? You covered it. <laughs> she wants the whole trinity. You know. All together. Okay. Um, I won't hang around on that. Did you notice that there, and here's where a book gives you little things that you can pick out as you go that uh, maybe not the story, but they're little things you'll hang on to. H. He said it was for Chinka. Chinka and the time she spent in the hospital and for the nurses who cared for her. He doesn't identify Chinka, but I'm presuming Chinka was he and his wife's daughter. That's the best that I can uh, come up with that. Okay, here's one. I want to hear your response. No story sits by itself. Put that aside. Our lives connect like threads on a loom, interwoven in ways we never realize. Our lives are connected like threads on a loom, interwoven in ways we never realize. What does that say to you? Oh, 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 oh. Here comes the runner. I think God puts people in our paths or puts us in their paths when we, are, are, you know, need somebody or they need somebody, okay. whether we realize it or not. But does God manipulate us? No, the he doesn't manipulate us, but I still think that there's times where you meet somebody that, you normally wouldn't have, but he put, you know, we went, you, we, our paths intersected. Okay. And it was a benefit, not only to that person, but to me. Okay. And you didn't necessarily see that intersection as being manipulated by God, but happening. Well, God may have probably had a hand in it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, some people would see it that way. Sherry. Uh, I agree totally with what she said. And in my own mind, I call them God moments. And I, I just know them. I feel them in my heart. Maybe it's the Holy Spirit talking to me. But I just know that I was meant to be in that person's vicinity or they were meant to be in mine because okay. God has a plan. And... Um, 
just, and I'm not going to go into a long story, but even meeting my husband, that was certainly a God moment that we intervened and became a couple and all of that. And so I, yeah, I fully agree. Okay, I see a lot of heads nodding out there. We all believe God has a plan, but is that plan for you, 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 you? Is it different for everybody? Or is it one great plan for the whole world? Now that's up to you to decide how it fits into your own faith. And that's what I'm really trying to accomplish in this book review, is to let your faith grow and understand whatever you feel, your God moments, however that happens in your life, that's up to you. God's given you a mind to think and a life to live, and we'll get into all that yet today. Okay, here's another one. Loss is as old as life itself. Loss, probably speaking of death, is as old as life itself. But for all of our evolution, we are yet to accept it. Think about that. But for all of our evolution, we are yet to accept loss. Um, as, as someone, well, I come at this two ways. As a pastor, I was oftentimes in a funeral home uh, when they used to do viewings and, and all that stuff, as you recall. And um, people would come in and say the dumbest things to the person who was a spouse of the deceased or a father, a parent, a child of the deceased, and they would just say some really, really dumb things. You don't come in to someone who has just lost a spouse and say, this was God's will. You know, and I've heard that so many times. Um, other times when you think of, of loss, you, you think of, um, well, the question then becomes when I, when I do my little spiel there, what do I say? What do I say? And there's, the first thing you want to say is, you're sorry for their loss. And then say, let God walk with you from here. And it's amazing how that walk will go. Um, not that my way is the way, but it's just after 53 and a half years of this, um, you've seen it all. Here is a good one. I, I don't know what to make of this one, so this is going to be up to you. Heaven seemed all blue. And then she realized she had no body, no middle, no bottom, no stomach, no thighs, no feet. What did that say to you? She was now in the afterlife. What? She was a spirit. I knew that's what would probably come out. Because that's all I could make of it. Um, something you... Carol? At the end, they know why it was that way. Because it was different in the first book. She was all complete. Right, right. In the first book, Eddie was complete. Well, it does go along with our theology of the resurrection is that um, our body here on earth uh, decays or we burn it or whatever. So we think of our consciousness as what goes to heaven, not a physical body. See why she's my teacher? <laughs> I like that. Uh, Joe's got something. I hope so, because I really don't want to walk around for a millennium in this body. <laughs> I was thinking the same I want someone else's. <laughs> I wouldn't mind having five pounds less. Yeah, but our bodies, even if this is our identity, 
in heaven, in my view, is going to be totally acceptable to everyone, even ourselves. Okay. So my, my genes won't keep shrinking? <laughs> Lynn. What was really strange is that they got pieces of their body back a little at a time. They got and why would they get their body back if they're a spirit? Okay. <laughs> now we're going to Revelation. God created a new heaven and a new earth. And it's like the new Jerusalem. We'll get into all that. So for 10 bucks, you can get that answer. But isn't that part of his storyline when you get to the end? She's not dead, which is why she didn't have all of this stuff to begin with. I mean, you can't she start at the away. beginning of the book. <laughs> and the end is the, di the, I think it's the end that threw everything off kind of prior to that. So she doesn't have a body because, yeah. you know, she's not dead. So she didn't have what Eddie had. She's. Man, that was where I had a problem with this book. <laughs> you have a problem with lots of our books. I know I do. <laughs> that was what. <laughs> well, one of the questions that I thought that we discussed later was, and you can be thinking about this, is the way the book was set up. Because the book was set up, we're thinking the next person you meet in heaven. And there's this diary or this autobiography or biography that goes through and intersperses in italics every so often. Um, and it would throw me off at the start. After I read it, halfway through, I began to get it. When I read it through the second time, I said, now I think I got it. And then the third time, put this together. So. Uh, Well, maybe after today you'll be able to. Maybe, because you're trying to find an answer in the first part, but you don't get the answer till it's the end, and that kind of throws off your whole thinking going in here. Like you're asking a question, and the answer is completely different because you got a different ending than you did in the first book. Okay. That's what makes the book. Yeah, I like that. That's what makes the book different. That's why it took him 15 years. To come out with a sequel. Yeah. Oh, she's going to get coffee. I thought. Oh, yeah. How about this one? This one you probably only need to nod on. Danger has no grip in the afterlife. Danger has no grip in the afterlife. You mean we won't be like driving in the villages? <laughs> okay. How about this one? The world does not cater to our timing. The world does not cater to our timing. Think about that. You know, I. I wanted to go to Michigan when I graduated from seminary, and that's what I put in for. So where do I end up? California, <laughs> then Wisconsin, then Ohio, then Michigan. Took a while to get there, but finally got there. Um, how about don't divine things happen every day? Do you all sense that? And how do you, with each of us, it's going to be different. How we determine what is divine. It, it varies from person to person. Okay, this one. Secrets. Secrets. We think by keeping them, we're controlling things. But all the while, they're controlling us. Okay, here's the last one. This last one is a statement. Uh, I loved it. On earth, we get the what of things. The why takes a little longer. On earth, we get the what of things. The why 
takes a little longer. Okay. Not, sometimes why takes an eternity. There is just no answer to why. Okay, I'll buy that. Okay, ready to go on? Okay, let's look at the first person that Annie meets when she gets to heaven. Samir. Remember Samir? Who was Samir? He was a doctor. Put her hand back together. But what happened as a result of that? Not to her, but to him. He became the hand surgeon because what he did with her was the first time he had ever done it. And so through what happened to her hand became transformative to other people for many years after that. See what other thoughts I had on that. Um, yeah, he had an accident at first. Yeah. Right. Right. See, you understood it, Carol. I understood it. Okay. I liked this comment that he made. Again, I'm trying to abide by copyright, so I didn't put it up there. Nobody can talk when they first arrive. It makes you listen better. I love that. I'm not sure I do, but uh, <laughs> nobody can talk when they first arrive. It makes you listen better. And Annie says, I'm just a person who what? makes mistakes, okay? Samir answers, I'm here because when you first get to heaven, you meet five people from your time on earth. They were all in your life for a reason. So, the first lesson that we gain from all of this is if this is really heaven, why would Samir be the one who greets Annie coming up there? Uh, and we go back to the question we had, aren't we supposed to be seeing Jesus or God or Jesus is God or the spirit, the angels, um, somebody said guardian angels, saints. Um, I don't know about seeing St. Peter first. Uh, you, you've all heard, no, many of you have heard my story about the guy who gets to heaven and meets St. Peter at the gate. And St. Peter says, what'd you ever do to get in here? And the guy says, well, you know, I had this manufacturing plant and we were doing very well and um, I was relaxing in my wealth and one day my wife decided to go on a mother's march on polio. Any of you old enough to remember those days? Uh, mother's march on polio. And she said to me before she left the house, I think you should contribute first. So I reached in my pocket and I gave her a dollar. So St. Peter says, is that right, Michael? And St. Michael goes down the list and said, yeah, that's right. Well, what else did you do? He says, well, you know, our company began to get pretty big. And so we hired a director of public relations. And she became very involved in the community. And she was on the board of United Way. And she came in my office and said, you know, I think our company should be 100% United Way. He says, I don't think that's my decision. She said, well, how about you being a part of United Way and making a contribution? So 
reached in his pocket and he gave her a dollar. St. Peter says, is that right, St. Michael? Michael went down the list. Yeah, that's right. He said, well, what else did you ever do? The guy said, hmm, I really don't know. So St. Peter turns to St. Michael and says, what do you think we ought to do? And St. Michael says, give him back his two bucks and tell him to go to hell. <laughs> okay. But the point is, we make so much, that's all we know, we make so much of our time here on earth that we forget our time is linked to other times. We can come in and praise God for eternity, and yet, you know, we get out in our car and holler at the person for not going fast enough ahead of us. Or we get behind somebody in Publix, and you know how villagers shop? They grab a buggy. In South Carolina, we call them buggies, not carts. Call a buggy, and they go down the aisle. Then they turn the buggy sideways. Then they go and start <laughs> looking for things up there. And you want to get around the buggy. So what do you say? Anyway, I don't know where that was leading me. But uh, our, our time is linked. <laughs> I got it off. My, it's been there a long time. So that's the first person. What becomes then the first lesson through, think about, Samir and his injury, and then Annie and her injury, and the reconstruction, and how that goes on to fit other people's lives. So what's the first lesson we learn from this? How about that? So, yes. I just, I just thought that he made a mistake and there was this wonderful outcome that fixed her mistake that left them with this wonderful outcome of reconstruction and no one saw that coming. Okay. It's just the way it goes around and you don't understand nor do you see those blessings coming. They're just yeah. there. And that's when we'll understand that whole thing is when we get to heaven. In the meantime, we're just going through the day not understanding how that all tied together. Right. Good. Okay, let's look at the second person. Who was the second person that Annie encountered in heaven? Leo. Leo. Cleo. Leo. Cleo. 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 The dog. Cleo. 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 And the dog. What else was Cleo? An old woman. Okay. So there we have Cleo the dog, the old woman. Now, we're all sitting here with our earthly minds saying, how can a dog be an old woman? Uh, or how can an old woman be a dog? But then you get the connection of the dog to Annie's life. And uh, great things happen there uh, for Annie as she encounters that. Um, a solitary afterlife seems unimaginably grim. Think about times when you're feeling alone and you're just there. That's just unimaginably grim. But there is an empathy between Cleo the dog and Annie. And what becomes that lesson? That lesson is what? Loneliness ends when someone needs you. Loneliness ends when someone needs you. Now you can put that in your life and think how often that has happened, either to you or through you or by you. Loneliness happens, ends when someone needs you. Okay, that's what we learned from Cleo and the head of the Humane Society uh, who puts Annie in touch with Cleo, the dog. 
Any questions? Jump in anytime. Peg's got the phone. Okay, Kathy. I just thought it was funny when the dog's run, running alongside the car. <laughs> and the old woman, and I'm like, oh, this must be the dog. <laughs> and she got out of breath. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you recall. I just love the lines, I cried for you, you cry for me. Ah. That empathy, you cried. Empathy. I cried for you, you cry for me. Very good. I thought it was really odd that he would put an animal in heaven. Um, but then on the other hand, it would be particularly comforting to people who actually adore and love their pets that they're going to possibly see them again. It just was a hopeful, hope-filled episode. Spoken by the mother of the dog from hell. <laughs> Marley and me personified. <laughs> Carol? Yeah, we had a dog from hell for three years. It lasted. I don't have a problem with the dog thing. I want to think my dogs are up there and they're going to be there when I get there. I oh. just have a problem calling it a person. <laughs> the next person oh. you meet in heaven is not a dog. Well, they were all connected. And I love the message. I just didn't like the vehicle that he used to get you there. When are you going to write your book? <laughs> I'm not. I'm just a critic. <laughs> <laughs> but to be believable, dogs can't talk. So he had to make it a person who could communicate with her. was uh -huh. when the next person isn't a person. Okay. He made it a person, but it's still a dog. I mean, and uh -huh. I sympathize. I think dogs understand you perfectly. Don't get me wrong. I love the concept. I just have a problem with the fact that he made the dog a person. I don't, I don't but know. But that's it, earthly that's, thought. Well, the dog's a dog. Lynn thought it was good. Okay, so what, what do we learn from that? We learn that loneliness ends when someone needs you. Okay, let's look at the third person. And who's the third person? It's Annie's mom. So now, as we look at Annie's mom, in between was that one little section on the next eternity, and she's like on this island, and these peninsulas kind of surround her uh, with love, with care, and that's her mother comes out of the peninsulas. Okay, you got a dog becoming a person. Now you got land becoming a person. <laughs> but at least it's a person. Okay. And so from that, from that third person, it was like a giant hand. And, and I don't know if this is where Deacon Bruce got it or not, but um, Annie found out she got her name by that woman that went over Niagara Falls in the barrel in 1901. Was it 1901? Yep, 1901. And so what's the third, third thing we learn? And it's multiple things. So I'm going to say that uh, about Annie and her mom, multiple things. Do you want to look at it first? Then we'll talk about them. The third lesson, courage. The need to confess. Forgiveness. Who did the forgiving? Annie or her mom? Annie. Both. If you really think about it and go back, both of them did the forgiving. And grace that comes through forgiveness. Yes, dear. Well, I think Her we name's Peg, but I always say yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think all of us carry some baggage of our parents, and we fail to understand their reasoning for what they did. And in Annie's case, she lost her mother before she ever could get those answers. 
So for her to actually meet her in heaven and get those answers had to be one heck of a, a release of pent up guilt and whatever she may have been carrying. And her loneliness as well. Yes. Um, things happened in my life that I could not discuss with my children and they uh, blamed me for a, a lot of things that I really was protecting them from, which Annie's mother was too, and not able to discuss with them. And um, it's a big burden for our children to carry at times, I think. And so we keep it a secret then? Hmm. Okay. See, I know what you're talking about, so I'm <laughs> got a little bit more. Any other thoughts on this? Yes. Close on that, but, you know, because, we embrace, because we embrace our scars more than our healing, ah, yes. we can recall the exact day we got hurt, but who remembers the day the wound was gone? Yep. I like that. Yep. Yeah, I, I thought of that. Um, some of you might not be aware. Pastor Barry's grandson um, had an accident at daycare. How old is Declan? Two? Two and a half. Two and, a half and broke his femur. And, of course, he's in a body cast. And I immediately thought of November 13th, 1948, when I broke my femur. But don't ask me, you know, three months later or somewhere along the line, they took the cast off and then they wrapped it for a while. And I was on crutches and, uh, you, you know, but you remember the date that something happens. But you don't remember when the wound begins to heal. Has it? What? Has it healed? As it heals? Or? No, has it healed for you? Yeah, yeah. But oftentimes it's in comparison, and here I'll give you a little comparison to a friend of mine who within a week had broken his femur as well. Uh, we were both, we weren't in uniformed football games, we were in pickup football games. Um, I was playing Slaughterhouse. I don't know if you knew what that meant. That's where you got the ball and uh, I lived two doors away from the children's home when they had children's home. And so there'd be about eight, ten guys out there playing. And so throw the ball up in the air. Whoever catches it, everybody else tries to catch them, tackle them, slaughter them. It's called slaughter them. And the same thing happened to Bob. And uh, I'm not going to, Bob's family had a little more wealth than my family did. So Bob got to go to the Cleveland Clinic where they inserted a pin uh, in his leg. My break was such that my bone went like that. My doctor was an osteopath who I swear by, I love osteopaths. And what he did, because in the 16-bed osteopathic hospital where I was, they had one traction. traction and it was in use. So he tied me to the bed and then tied up my ankle, put a pulley on the end of the bed with a gallon jug on it. And every day he'd come in and add another quart of water and take a portable x-ray. And when it came out and was like that, I said, let's go down. And down they took me to surgical room, whatever, and put the cast on me. I never had a pin. You would know that to see me walk today. <laughs> but, but, Bob, but Bob continued to limp. He and I played on the golf team together, and that's why we can compare stories. Um, so you see these things that happen in your life, and uh, you get the courage. Okay, let's go on to the fourth person. The fourth person was whom? Was the old man from the wedding. 
Eddie? Yes, it was Eddie. And it's in interesting the way he's introduced as being that sh kind of shadowy figure uh, in the back at, at the wedding. Um, now, what was Eddie able to teach them, teach Annie, and teach us? Go to the fourth lesson here. I got to look at my notes. Oh, there I got it. Yeah. This becomes important. What? He gave his life. He gave his life. Okay. But it was to make up for the sake of the life that he took. Okay. Yep. You remember that as the fifth person in the first book. Peace with herself. Okay. Eddie taught her how to make peace. Taught her about making peace with herself. Okay. As a result of her many mistakes. Mistakes that like she thought were mistakes. Were, yes. Yeah. And just as he always thought he was a nothing who did anything good, he gave the ultimate sacrifice in his own mind, right. making up for his misdeed of the past, but the ultimate sacrifice, he gave his life for her. It became, um, it was a chapter for me that brought back lots of memories. Because how many here have been to Cedar Point? Oh, you've been to Cedar Point. My grandfather was the chief plumber at Cedar Point for over 20 years. Hotel breakers. Hotel breakers, as well as any other problems that they had with restrooms around uh, Cedar Point, but I think we went back to Cedar Point, um, I don't know, 20 years ago or something. Um, I, I know someone who had the courage to go up on the demon drop, and that's what I saw this um, amusement ride as when Annie is saved by Eddie. And it, uh, if you've ever seen the demon drop, you know, it goes down. I was not on it. I was there saying, please take care of Peg. <laughs> I think Mindy was probably with us too. Okay, so the fourth lesson then becomes mistakes. But mistakes lead to this very broad understanding of how salvation works. How does salvation work? We don't fully understand that, but we are now in the first day leading up to the cross. And so we're in a time of looking at ourselves, our mistakes, our confessions, and the cross of our Lord Jesus. Does that make any sense? And then we happen to know what happens after the cross. We're very blessed there. All right. Did I add anything else? No. Ah, the fifth person. Everybody knows who's the fifth person? Paulo. Paolo, Paulo. Needs a B in there. It needed to be Pablo so we could <laughs> understand it. But, but it's, it's Paulo. And um, Paulo says, or the book said, love comes when you least expect it. Love comes when you least expect it. Love comes when you most need it. Love comes when you are ready to receive it and can no longer deny it. The truth of love for Annie was that for a long time, she didn't expect love, and she got none in return. Life went on, and while she didn't know it then, she was learning another truth about love. It comes when it comes. And so we need to be open to it. And that becomes our fifth lesson. No, it doesn't. So our fifth lesson through all that, once we learn about love, what did Paulo help us learn, help Annie learn, 
but what? To live. To be grateful. And it was in there, I think, where the, the question was raised. I can't think exactly how it was stated. Um, how old is the right age to die? Did any of you remember that? How old is the right age to die? It's different for everybody. It's different for everybody, yes. We had a good witness on that last night from last night's class of someone who had lost a spouse at a very young age and um, how that made a change in their life and how they learned through that to become grateful. Any other thoughts on that particular thing? Because, go ahead, dear. Well, I was just thinking the first four people gave her answers for her mistakes. Mm -hmm. The fifth person was just the opposite. Mm -hmm. This was a mistake that she made in, in forcing him to take the, the balloon ride. And so it kind of ended about face for her. Hmm. Anybody else see that? Think that? You were saved from dying once, Annie. You owe the world some saving in return. It's why you became a nurse, and it's why you need to go back to save someone else. Ah, there it is, the conclusion. You need to go back and save someone else. So be grateful and live. <coughs> this becomes part of the epilogue at the end, which is to give us the most precious word that became the word for Annie at this point in her life, which was, and a lot of people had different, different answers here. Gratitude. Gratitude. Hope. Hope. How about, you ready for it? Home. She's going to go home to help others. So, we're doing well on time, I think. These are some discussion questions now for all of us. All endings are beginnings. What does that mean to you? That all endings are beginning. How, how would you see that playing forth in your life? When God closes a, win a door, he opens a window. Now you got manipulating life again, don't you? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> it just means that even though something is painful that has ended, doesn't mean something joyful is just around the corner. Okay. There's always hope. There's always hope. He gets to start over. Are we just talking about people or are we talking about the whole of creation? Think about that. When it comes to nature, to animals, to birds, trees. I have to think of that when I think I have a neighbor on one side and a neighbor across the street who have these gigantic live oak trees <laughs> that just drive me bananas because all the leaves come in my yard. and. We, we had lots of oak trees in South Carolina and lots of pine trees that had a big lot. And we moved here and Peg looked out and saw that oak in the middle of our front yard. It was only about that big at the time. So, Mr. Morris, we're, we're sorry, but we asked for forgiveness. But we immediately had it taken out and put in a palm tree. I've been thankful to her for doing that ever since. <laughs> Her oak tree got stolen one night. You can be thankful for that, Joe. Yeah. Believe me, you'd have a lot of raking to do. Probably half of you have an oak tree in your yard. Um, They're gorgeous in somebody else's yard. Until they shed. Right. But, but you know, all endings are beginnings. 
think of that in terms of, um, you know, I love the garden a little bit. So pruning, you prune something back. We had a ligustrum in our front yard that was at least that high and that big around. It was starting to get in the way. And so I just told the people who trimmed my bushes, I said, take it down. And he came and said, well, is this far enough? I said, no. So we got it down to a stump like that. You should see it now. In one year's time, that ligustrum is just the most beautiful two-foot plant you ever saw. Now, I'll ask the big question. It has nothing to do with anything we've talked about. Does anybody know when's a good time to trim back hibiscus? Even Alexa didn't know. <laughs> I asked her the other day. Ask the master gardener, okay. Well, what I did finally find out, Googling it in, was that I missed it. <laughs> it was supposed to be October, November, and here I am in, in March. Oh, well. All endings are beginnings. What does that mean to you that life, in many ways, regenerates? We do things today that we couldn't do 20 years ago. There's things we can't do today that we did 20 years ago or 30 years ago, um, whether it's bending over or picking up or anything. Okay, here's the next one. What does heaven on earth mean to you? Heaven on earth. It means taking time <clears throat> to look around you and see the beauty that surrounds you Okay. in each moment of the day, being that, quiet and still. Right. I, I like that coming from you, Lynn, because of your artistic background, and you know I can see all that in your life. Sherry? I think it's when I'm in a season of peace because there can be real difficult seasons in anyone's life, um, death, other stressors. And for me, heaven on earth is when I recognize that I'm in a season of personal peace and calm. Of serenity? Serenity, definitely. How many of you, let's see your hands, even today, but probably 10 years ago, always look forward to vacation. <laughs> yeah. I know we did. And we st I still do. I still do. Uh, and, and I'm toying with my own guilt of unplugging that stupid landline where everybody's trying to sell me Medicare insurance, Medic Alert. Uh, I forget. What? Braces and just about anything you want, you know. Uh, you hold up your phone, you know, and it rings. I wait till the f fourth ring or so, then I hit it. Hello. As <laughs> usual. Oh, and then, oh, 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 yeah. You know, and what bugs me is when they know your name. So don't ever say yes. You know, are you Nita? Don't say yes. Say you're talking to me. Then they don't. Click it on. That's what my son says. Well, so. that's in case they want a, a scam right. where they can record your voice agreeing to what they're asking you to do. Right. Okay. So heaven on earth means a little serenity, fellas. So this and the new heaven, the new earth will be heaven on earth. You have to read my book on that. <laughs> Because it's described as the New Jerusalem. Correct. And it's got 12 gates. Why does it have 12 gates on each side? You've got 12 tribes of Israel. You've got the 12 apostles. Everything it becomes symbolic at that point. And that's where I approach the whole book. So basically what my book is is a commentary on the book of Revelation. But so. heaven will be on earth? In your opinion. 
says, I create a new heaven and a new earth. But as you look at what the new heaven and the new earth is, it relates back to Genesis as God created it in the first place. And now in the new heaven and the new earth, the river flows down the middle of the town. And there is the tree of life on both sides of the river compared to the creation in Genesis. And so you see some combinations there that um, are many, are many. So, you know, I, I've often said, and some of you know that, that I am still somewhat a crazy golfer. I, I played golf now for 68 years, if you believe that. My first set of clubs were wooden shafted clubs that my dad had brought home and from the pro, there were five of them, peeled off that old leather grip, sawed them off for a little short guy like me and put those grips back on and that's how I played my first game of golf in the, the first year. Um, and many of you will be interested to know that the first nine holes I ever played on a regulation course, because we didn't have such things as executive courses, was an 81 for nine holes. Now you all can do math, right? <laughs> 81 is what? Nine. nine times nine. And I was playing with my uncle and my dad, my brother. My uncle was a pastor. And when he told me my score at the end, I said, gee, why, why was, I was mathematic enough to say, why was that nine times nine? He said, because that little square is only big enough to hold one number. <laughs> so I had nine on every hole. <laughs> that's, that's heaven on earth. Now, with that thought in mind, um, there are some days we don't like to play golf, um, when it's cold, when it's rainy, whatever. But uh, if there aren't golf courses in heaven, there's going to be something greater. If there aren't lakes in heaven where we can go for our serenity of two weeks of quiet fishing where you can't get any internet and you have no, you have your telephone but it works if you go out to the street and drive three miles and get to the library in this little town. Um, that's serenity. But there's going to be something great and that's then you got to start talking about who do I enter connect with because Jesus said there will be no marrying or giving in marriage and and people have grappled with that one for a long time and that doesn't mean you're not going to be with your spouse it means to me that you don't have to go through all the rigmarole at the clerk of courts uh, and, and stand in line and go pick it up later. And uh, Florida is good that way, incidentally. So if any of you are thinking of getting married again or married somewhat, you just walk in the clerk of courts, you fill it out. You can take it over to pastor or justice of the peace the next day, that the, that day, and have your marriage performed. There's no waiting time. So anyway. Some of the imperfections of the earth, most of the, all of the imperfections of the earth will be gone. That's how I, I see it. Heaven on earth. Any makes a mistake. Why do you think that was the case? That was her looking at herself. How about this? Do you ever wonder about your funeral? He asked that in the book. Who's going to come? Why are they going to be there? What are they going to say? Are you going to be up there looking down and saying, oh, that's really bad. <laughs> Think about that. 
followed up with this one. Do you ever feel mortal? You know what I mean by that? <laughs> Every day you Every feel mortal. <laughs> you say, I'm still there. Aches and, Aches and pains. How about the work you go through? You begin, as you approach certain dates in your life, do you feel mortal? What? I I think Charles, that's about right. The older you get, the more mortal you feel. Uh, Peg. The thought just went. Sh that's true. Well, I was going to say that um, I feel more mor mortal at a memorial service than any other time because I definitely see an ending for someone, some, an ending on earth for someone. Mm -hmm. So that's when I feel the most mortal. Okay. Another way of putting that is that God is still on earth. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, kind of. And yes and no. If, if we live in the expectation of an eternal life, then we are ready to accept it, the mortality. Uh, you know, when they punctured my heart, I, I didn't know how serious it was until Peg told me five days later when they finally got me out of ICU. You know, I, I think of that. I think of it at certain times of the year. Christmas, think about it. Uh, when you're with family. Um, when will I see them next? I, I have a big day coming up in my life in June. Um, when you reach a certain age, you begin to feel, you know, I didn't feel significant mortality when I turned 79, but now that I'm going to turn <coughs> that, that double oval, uh, you begin to think, oh, gee, I am old. But the other way I look at it is, do any of you get the Living Lutheran here? The Living Lutheran is the magazine of the ELCA. It comes once a month. And uh, in the next to last page, always, are the obituaries of clergy and deacons. And number one, when you've served the church in different places like I have, California, Wisconsin, Ohio, Michigan, South Carolina, and Florida, you know quite a few pastors. And then when you serve for the National Church for five years and you're flying around to Nebraska and Boston and Maryland and other places, you know quite a few people. So the first thing I do is I go through and see if there's anybody I know who has died. But then there's an immediate second thing I do. I go through and they put their ages after their name. And I count how many are older than me, how many are younger than me. Do you ever read that in the obituaries of the newspaper? Yeah, okay. That's the feeling of mortality. Cora. No, you can't. Uh, <laughs> uh, I always think about it when uh, these advertisements come on the television, uh, your funeral costs, planning your funeral, and then in the paper, you want to go to these sem uh, uh, seminars to make sure that you have your funeral plan appropriately right. and, and whatever. But you all hear that? <laughs> and it's true. It's true. My, I even have the boxes up in my closet, you know, where my ashes will go. It's all planned, except for the service. Now, did you ever think, think about writing your own obituary? What would it say? Pastor Ellen did. 
Pastor Ellen did, yes. Congratulations on the paper. Lynn. You, you didn't want some, yeah. You didn't want somebody else to go through what you went through, writing it. Yes. Anyone else? Okay. What else do I have up here? Okay. If you were about to die, how would you spend your final hours? Eating every dessert in sight. <laughs> Last night, someone sitting here said, just give me chocolate. <laughs> just give me chocolate. I agree. I agree. Well, chocolate's good for you in, in, moderation. in moderation. Yes. So is a glass of wine in moderation. I try to keep both of those every day. Cora? Yeah, no, no, we want you on TV. <laughs> uh, I think I'd spend my final hours uh, with Charles and I just at home, being quiet and being together, and being peaceful. Cool. That's nice. Add the kids to that. You had the kids and you had the grandkids, and they're all running around. Joe? I always thought I, maybe I better show up banging on the door here saying, let me in, I gotta talk. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody remember what Luther said? Plant an apple tree? Yes, because he had planned, I'm planting an apple tree today, so if he were to die, he went out and planted the apple tree. That's how life goes on and sustains itself. Okay. Um, let me quote Mitchie Album once again. This one, I will forsake all copyright laws and quote him. This novel and its version of the afterlife is a wish and not a dogma. Is there anything wrong with each of us in our own way? wishing about our eternity, our afterlife. Is it helpful if you do? It's what? It, it gives hope, it gives Phyllis hope. said. Yeah, well, so it says, Book of Revelation, you're going to be thrown into a lake of fire if you don't behave. But now you got to balance that with forgiveness and grace. Just a lot of neat things there. But to think about that. And, and some of us do think about it. I don't think about it every day. I think about it when I do a book review. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't do those often. Um, while we're at it, before we get to the last slides, there's only two more to go. Next week, right here, same time, same place, 9 o'clock, we will have a review of the first 12 chapters of Matthew. I'll go through them quite quickly, and then we'll pick it up so that we end with the crucifixion and the resurrection during Holy Week. So that's the timing of why we're doing it that way. So you're going to have to put up with me for about six more weeks, I guess. And it'll be 9 o'clock through Lent. It'll be 9 o'clock through Lent so that you can come here. We'll meet from 9 to 10.30. You can go down and get a good seat in church uh, for the services. And then when the service is over, you can go have bread and soup. So... Kill three birds with one stone. It's a good way to do it. <coughs> and and this will also be on Tuesday night, but we won't have any food to eat. 
except somebody's going to bring some thinness, but that's for Wednesday. Okay. No pressure. What does that say to you? Just think about that. Okay. How do we see the afterlife? And did this book change our feelings? Did it broaden our horizons a little bit? There, Pam. I think it made me feel more, it made me think more about what I do now than it made me think about the afterlife. Good. And how I might impact other people and other people okay. impact me. It really didn't make me think about afterlife. Okay. Anybody else? I um, wondered, I guess, <coughs> what happens after you meet your five people? You become one of those who meets other. You become one of the next five for someone else. That's true until you get through two or three generations and you don't know anybody that's coming in. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question to ask Mitch Album. Not me. And <laughs> Sherry? And why five people? Why not 12 like the Bible? Hmm. Maybe we can only remember five. <laughs> I'm just saying. 12 would make a thicker book. Yeah. So come on Monday, Thursday evening, and you'll see the Living Last Supper, and you see the 12 apostles right there. Um, if you come on Friday, you'll see the resurrection of this. Okay. That living last supper is only in the evening service, correct? Right. Okay. Only at 7 o'clock? I think it's 7 o'clock. And there are tickets. You need tickets because we overflowed to the parking lot the last time. So um, they're free. They're free, but... I think, what, when do they pick them up? I, think um, I don't think they've published when they're going to be available for pickup, but watch the newsletter and the announcements. Okay. Are they taping it? Are they taping it? You can't it, because it's copyrighted. It's copyrighted. So we can't live stream it either. Yeah. That, that whole page I have to memorize is in quotes. Yeah, Joe? I can't believe that, but I was one of the people up there, and my son had his baseball, basketball, some team running around the house, and one guy said, your mom's walking around reading and pointing and yelling, and I was reading <laughs> the Bible, and he goes, oh yeah, it's my mom, she really gets into Easter. <laughs> uh, it's a good experience, uh, I don't know why I said yes again, but Five years ago was the last time we did it here, and we're going to do it again. Well, about half of us are repeats, and the other half I'm trying to convince to grow beards. So, okay, here's my view, my thought of the afterlife. Oh, there's another air thing. And I like to carry that with me. Thank you all for being here. God bless you. And go in peace, serenity, love, and serve the Lord. Thank you. <laughs>